entered at Stationer's Hall. Zetetic Astronomy, Earth, Not a Globe. An experimental inquiry into the true figure of the Earth, proving it a plane, without axial or orbital motion, and the only material world in the universe, by Parallax. London, Simpkin, Marshall & Co., Stationer's Hall Court, Bath, Hayward, Green Street, 1865. The right of translation is reserved by the author. Bath, printed at South Hayward, Green Street. General Contents, Section 1, Introduction, Experiments Proving the Earth to be a Plane. Section 2, The Earth, No Axial or Orbital Motion. Section 3, The True Distance of the Sun and Stars. Section 4, The Sun Moves in a Circle Over the Earth, Concentric with the North Pole. Section 5, Diameter of the Sun's Path Constantly Changing. Section 6, Cause of Day and Night, Seasons, Etc. Section 7, Cause of Sunrise and Sunset. Section 8, Cause of Sun Appearing Larger When Arising and Setting and when in meridian. Section 9, cause of solar lunar eclipses. Section 10, cause of the tides. Section 11, constitution, condition, and ultimate destruction of the earth by fire. Section 12, miscellaneous, moon's phases, moon's appearance, planet Neptune, pendulum experiments as proof of earth's motion. Section 13, Perspective on the Sea. Section 14, General Summary, Application, Cubono. Zetetic Astronomy. The term zetetic is derived from the Greek verb zeteo, which means to search or examine, to proceed only by inquiry. None can doubt that by making special experiments and collecting manifest and undeniable facts, arranging them in logical order and observing what is naturally and fairly deducible, the result will be far more consistent and satisfactory than by framing a theory or system and assuming the existence of causes for which there is no direct evidence and which only can be admitted for the sake of argument. All theories are of this character, supposing instead of inquiring imagining systems instead of learning from observation and experience the true constitution of things. Speculative men by the force of genius may invent systems that will perhaps be greatly admired for a time. These, however, are phantoms which the force of truth will sooner or later dispel. And while we are pleased with the deceit, true philosophy, with all the arts and improvements that depend upon it, suffers. The real state of things escapes our observation, or if it presents itself to us, we are apt either to reject it, wholly as fiction, or by new efforts of vain, ingenuity to interweave it with our own conceits, and labor to make it tally with our favorite schemes. Thus, by blending together all parts so ill-suited, the whole becomes forth an absurd composition of truth and error. These have not done near so much harm as that pride and ambition which has led philosophers to think it beneath them to offer anything less to the world than a complete and finished system of nature. And in order to obtain this at once, to take the liberty of inventing certain principles and hypotheses from which they pretend to explain all her mysteries. Copernicus admitted, it's not necessary that hypothesis should be true or even probable. It is sufficient that they lead to results of calculation which agree with calculations. Neither let any one, so far as hypotheses are concerned, expect anything certain from astronomy, since that science can afford nothing of the kind, lest in case he should adopt for truth things find for another purpose. He should leave this study more foolish than he came. The hypothesis of the terrestrial motion was nothing but an hypothesis, valuable only so far as it explained phenomena, and not considered with reference to absolute truth or falsehood. 
An Account of Sir Isaac Newton's Discoveries by Professor McLaurin, M.A., F.R.S., of the Chair, Mathematics at the University of Edinburgh. Newtonian and all other systems of nature are little better than the hypothesis of the terrestrial motion of Copernicus. These foundations, or premises, are always unproved. No proof is ever attempted. The necessity for it is denied. It is considered sufficient that the assumptions shall seem to explain the phenomena selected. In this way, it is that one theory supplants another. That system gives way to system as one failure after another compels opinions to change. This will ever be so. There will always exist in the mind a degree of uncertainty, a disposition to look upon philosophy as a vain pretension, a something almost antagonistic to the highest aspirations in which humanity can indulge, unless the practice of theorizing be given up, and the method of simple inquiry, the zetetic process, be adopted. Nature speaks to us in pecul peculiar language. In the language of phenomena, she answers at all times the questions which are put to her, and such questions are experiments not experiments only which corroborate what has previously been assumed to be true, but experiments in every form bearing on the subject of inquiry, before a conclusion is drawn or premise is affirmed. We have an excellent example of zetetic reasoning in a, in a arithmetical operation, more especially so in what is called the golden rule, or the rule of three. If one hundred weight of any article is worth a given sum, what will some other weight of that article be worth? The separate figures may be considered as the elements or facts of the inquiry. The placing and working of these as the logical arrangement and the quotient or answer is the fair and natural deduction. Hence, in every zetetic process, the conclusion has arrived at is essentially a quotient, which, if the details be correct, must be of necessity be true beyond the reach or power of contradiction. In our efforts of justice, we have also an example of the zetetic process. A prisoner is placed at the bar. Evidence for and against him is advanced. It is carefully arranged and patently considered, and only such a verdict given us could not in justice be avoided. Society would not tolerate any other procedure. It would brand with infamy whomever should assume a prisoner to be guilty and prohibit all evidence but such as would corroborate the assumption. Yet such is the character of theoretical philosophy. The zetetic process is also the natural method of investigation. Nature herself teaches it. Children invariably seek information by asking questions, by earnestly inquiring from those around them. Question after question in rapid and exciting succession will often proceed from a child until the most profound in learning philosophy will feel puzzled to reply. If both nature and justice, as well as the common sense and practical experience of mankind demand, and will not be content with less or other than the zetetic process, why should it be ignored and violated by the learned in philosophy? Let the practice of theorizing be cast aside as one fatal to the full development of truth, oppressive to the reasoning power, and in every sense inimical to the progress and permanent improvement of the human race. If then we adopt the zetetic process to ascertain the true figure and condition of the earth, we shall find that instead of its being a globe and moving in space, it is the direct contrary, a plane without motion and unaccompanied by anything in the firmament analogous to itself. If the earth is a globe and 25,000 miles in circumference, the surface of all standing water must have a certain degree of convexivity. Every part must be an arc of a circle, curvating from the summit at the rate of 8 inches per mile multiplied by the square of the distance. That this may be sufficiently understood, the following quotation is given from the encyclopedia. Britannica art, quote, leveling, quote, 
if a line which crosses the plumb line at right angles be continued for any considerable length, it will rise above the Earth's surface, the Earth being globular in this hypothesis, and this rising will be as the square of the distance to which the said right line is produced. So, that is to say, it's raised 8 inches very nearly above the Earth's surface at 1 mile distance, 4 times as much, or 32 inches, at the distance of 2 miles, 9 times as much, or 72 inches, at the distance of 3 miles. This is owing to the globular figure of the Earth, and this raising is the difference between the true and apparent levels, the curve of the Earth being the true level, and the tangent to it the apparent level. So soon does the difference between the true and apparent levels become perceptible that it is unnecessary to make an allowance for it if the distance betwixt the two stations exceeds two chains. Picture 1. Let B, D, be a small portion of the Earth's circumference whose center of curvature is A, and consequently all the points of this arc will be on a level. But a tangent BC, meeting the vertical line A, D, and C, will be the apparent level at the point B, and therefore DC is the difference between the apparent and the true level at point B. The distance CD must be deducted from the observed height to have the true difference of level, or the differences between the distances of two points from the surface of the Earth, or from the center of curvature. But we shall afterwards see how this correction may be avoided altogether in certain cases. To find an expression for CD, we have Euclid, third book, 36, prop, which proves that the BC squared equals CD, 2AD times CD. But since in all cases of leveling, CD is exceedingly small compared with 2AD, we may safely neglect CD and then BC equals 2AD times CD or CD equals BC squared over 9AD. Hence the depression of the true level is equal to the square of the distance divided by twice the radius of the curvature of the Earth. For example, taking a distance of 4 miles, the square of 4 equals 16, and putting down twice the radius of the Earth's curvature, as in round figures about 8,000 miles, we make the depression on 4 miles equals 16 over 8,000, of a mile equals 16 times 1760 over 8,000, in yards equals 160, 176 over 50, Yards equals 528 over 50 feet, or rather better than 10 and a half feet. Or if we take the mean radius of the Earth as the mean radius of its curvature, and consequently 2 AD equals 7912 miles, then 5280 feet being 1 mile, we shall have the CD in the depression in inches, 5280 times 12 times BC squared over 7912 equals. 8,008 B.C. squared inches. The preceding remarks suppose the visual ray C.B. to be a straight line, whereas, on account of the unequal densities of the air at different di distances from the Earth, the rays of light are incurvated by refraction. The effect of this is to lessen the difference between the true and apparent levels, but in such an extremely variable and uncertain manner that if any constant or fixed allowance is made for it in formula or tables, it will often lead to a greater error than what was intended to obviate. For though the effraction may at a mean compensate for about a seventh of the curvature of the earth, it sometimes exceeds a fifth, and at other times does not amount to a fifteenth. We have therefore made no allowance for refraction of the foregone formula. If the earth is a globe, there cannot be a question that, however irregular, the land may be in form, the water must have a convex surface. And as the difference between the true and apparent level or the degree of curvature would be 8 inches in 1 mile, and in every succeeding mile 8 inches multiplied by the square of the distance, there can be no difficulty in detecting either its actual existence or proportion.